Hello everyone, and welcome back to Let's Play Skyrim. Last time, we did a lot of questing and wrapped up everything in Whiterun Save the Companions. Today, we're ready to join the Companions, clear out Yorvaskar as much as we can, and really just join our first faction and get going on that. So, a note on Yorvaskar before we actually go inside. There is, there are certain areas where things eventually become free to take and certain things where they don't. So I'll kind of talk about that as we go through it. I'm not going to bother talking to anyone until after I've joined and have a quest and have kind of settled in. So yeah, let's just get started. There are 12 residents in here. 12 people we need to worry about. When we first walk in, there will be a fist fight going on, and it can take a long, long time to wrap up. Because unarmed damage is low. Now, this communal hall that we're in right now, everything in here becomes free to take as soon as we finish the first quest, take up arms, and join the companions. So, we can basically ignore it. We just need to look for... I don't even need to look for useful stuff, really. What are you waiting for? It's your best. But I'd like to. Assuming I can ever become hidden. Which it looks like I might not be able to. Yeah, you know what? We'll just save the communal hall until Take Up Arms is finished. That'll happen soon enough, anyway. This bedroom here belongs to Vignar, Greymane, and Brill. Nothing in here ever becomes free to take. So it's a good idea to go ahead and steal. So I'll just go ahead and do exactly that. And again, I'll only bother talking about new books if we find any. There will be a few, but not many. Nothing really useful yet. As far as I can tell, the outcome of the fist fight is pretty much a foregone conclusion. Silver ingots are useful. We already have all we need for the associated quests, of course. So, let's just keep on swiping stuff. Apologies for that little hiccup in the recording. Let's head back out here. See if there's anything new on this bookshelf. There isn't. Nothing useful in there. Six gold in that cupboard. Enough. You think you stand a chance? Oh, the fist fight's haven't over. Haven't seen your face before. I'm watching you. Oh, never mind. Not over. He was just staggered. Oh no, it is over. Good. Let's see, I have useful things in both of these sacks and in the chest. I've got a bad grip on my shield. Can you take a look at it? I'm a warrior, not a blacksmith. Can't you just tell me if the grip is bad? If Aorlin made it, it's more likely you're gripping it. Wrong. Find me tomorrow and we can go over it. Okay, let's just keep going through here. All this stuff becomes free to take. In pretty short order. But, right here, we've got a book, which I'm not going to take yet, but Holgerd's Tale, a Tavi Dromeo. You'll notice our heavy armor skill jumped up, making this, I think, our first heavy armor skill book. Let me check to be sure. Yes, it is. Holgerd's Tale comes off the book list. If I go to free skill boosts, Heavy armor has seven boosts. We're down to six now. 
Only four skill books left to find. Let's actually read the book. Again, apologies for the recording hiccup. Holgard's Tale by Tabby Dromeo. I think the greatest warrior who ever lived had to be Velus Nominus, offered Shomara. Name one other warrior who conquered more territory. Tiber Septim, obviously, said Holgard. He wasn't a warrior. He was an administrator, a politician, said Garaz. And besides, acreage conquered can't be final means of determining the best warrior. How about skill with a blade? There are other weapons than blades, objected Jomara. Why not skill with an axe or a bow? Who was the greatest master of all weaponry? I can't think of one greatest master of all weaponry, said Halgard. Balaxes of Aegea Nero in Black Marsh was the greatest wielder of a lance. Ernst Lervu of the Ashlands is the greatest master of the club I've ever seen. The greatest master of the katana is probably an Akaviri warlord we've never heard of. As far as archery goes, Pelinol Whitestrake supposedly conquered all of Tamriel by himself, interrupted Jomara. <laughs> that was before the first era, said Garaz. It's probably mostly myth, but there are all sorts of great warriors of the modern eras. The Cameron Usurper, the unknown hero who brought together the Staff of Chaos and defeated Jagar Tharn. We, ca we can't declare an unknown champion as the greatest warrior. What about Nandor Barade, the Empress Kataria's champion, suggested Jomara. They said he could use any weapon ever invented. But what happened to him, smiled Garaz. He was drowned in the Sea of Ghosts because he couldn't get his armor off. Call me overly particular, but I think the greatest warrior in the world should know how to take armor off. It's kind of hard to judge ability to wear armor as a skill, said Jomara. Either you have basic functionality in a suit of armor, or you don't. <clears throat> That's not true, said Holgard. There are masters in that as well. People who can do things while wearing armor better than we can out of armor. Have you ever heard of Flalu Pasoroff, the king's great-grandfather? <coughs> Jomara and Garaz admitted they, that they had not. This was hundreds and hundreds of years ago, and Pasoroff was the ruler of a great estate which he had won by right of being the greatest warrior in the land. It's been said, and truly, that much of the house's current power is based on Pasoroth's earnings as a warrior. Every week he held games at his castle, pitting his skill against the champions of the neighboring estates, and every week he won something. His great skill wasn't in the use of weaponry, though he was decent enough with an axe and a longsword but in his ability to move quickly and with great agility wearing a full suit of heavy mail. There were some who said that he moved faster while wearing armor than he did out of it. Some months before this story begins, he had won the daughter of one of his, beautiful, of one of his neighbors, a beautiful creature named Mina, who he had made his wife. He loved her very much, but he was intensely jealous and with good reason. She wasn't very pleased with his husbandly skills. And the only reason Mina never strayed was because Pesoroth kept a close eye on her. She was, to put it kindly, naturally amorous and resentful of her position as a prize. Wherever he went, he always brought her with him. At the games, she was placed in a special box so that he could see her even while he competed. But his real competition, though he didn't know it, was from a handsome young armorer he also had won at one of his competitions. Mina had noticed him, and the armorer, whose name was Terran, had certainly noticed her. This has all the makings of a dirty joke, Halgard, said Jomara with a smile. I swear that it's entirely true, said Halgard. The problem facing the lovers was, of course, that they could never be alone. Perhaps because of this, it became a burning obsession to both of them. Terran decided that the best time for them to consummate their love was during the games. Mina feigned illness, so she didn't have to stay in the box. But Pesoroth visited the sick room every few minutes between fights, so Terran and Mina could never get together. The sound of Pesoroth's armor clunking up the stairs to visit his sick wife gave Terran the idea. He crafted his lord a new suit of armor, strong and bright and beautifully decorated. For his purposes, Terran rubbed the leg joints with Luka dust, so the more he sweated and the more he moved at them, the more they'd stick together. After a little while, Terran figured, Pesoroth wouldn't be able to walk very quickly, and wouldn't have enough time in between fights to visit his wife. But just in case, Terran also added bells to the legs which rung loudly when they moved, so the couple would be able to hear him coming in plenty of time. When the games commenced the following week, 
Mina feigned illness again, and Terran presented his lord with the new armor. Basoroth was delighted with it, as Terran hoped he would be, and donned it for his first fight. Terran then stole upstairs to Mina's bedchamber. All was silent outside as the two began to make love. Suddenly, Mina noticed a peculiar expression on Terran's face, and before she had a chance to ask him about it, his head fell off at the neck. Basoroth was standing behind him with his axe in hand. How did he get upstairs so quickly with his leg joints gummed up? And didn't they hear the bells ringing? asked Garaz. Well, you see, when Basoroth realized he couldn't walk on his legs very quickly, he walked on his hands. I don't believe it, laughed Jomara. What happened next? asked Garaz. Did Basoroth kill Mina also? No one knows exactly what happened next, said Halgird. Basoroth didn't return for the next game, nor for the next. Finally, at the fourth game, he returned to fight, and Mina appeared in the box to watch. She didn't appear to be sick anymore. In fact, she was smiling and had a light flush to her face. They did it? cried Jomara. I don't have all the salacious details, except that after the battle, it took ten squires thirteen hours to get Pesoroth's armor off, because of all the Luka dust mixed with sweat. I don't understand. You mean he didn't take his armor off when they... But how? Like I said, replied Halgard, this is a story about someone who was more agile and accomplished in his armor than out of it. Now that's skill, said Garaz. I think I already looked in there and declared nothing useful. That one's empty. Let's go over here. Just have a sack and a chest. Cave bear pelt is useful. Let's bounce down to the living quarters. <clears throat> now this communal area in the living quarters, things also become free to take here as soon as we complete take up arms. So again, I'm just looking for useful stuff or new books. Got none of that so far. I was going to say, I distinctly remember a coin purse. And there it is, and there's another. We got s a few elves' ears hanging up there. This is the communal bedroom. Things in here also become free to take. We've read both of those, thankfully. Let's just get that coin purse. So if we keep going over here, finding rather quickly that the nothing useful theme continues, as well as no new books, which is all just as well to me. I do want that little bit of gold. I'll steal the rest of it after take up arms when it's free to take. Those there's another coin purse on that table, so we'll grab that. And search these sacks and barrels just in case there are salt piles. On the very rare occasion you'll suddenly get rarer ingredients in a barrel, but almost always salt piles the best you can do. I want that coin purse. Now these two hallways still count as communal area, so this stuff all eventually becomes free to take. But you notice these doors I'm ignoring briefly. Those are the bedrooms belonging to the circle. I'll identify which member they belong to. The only way any of it ever becomes free to take is uh, if you marry the person who it belongs to. And I'm not planning on marrying any of them, so we'll just go ahead and steal everything. Oh, good. I thought those two had started talking, which I was not ready for. 
But for, for these four bedrooms, we can go ahead and steal everything. Not just the useful stuff. Because it never becomes free to take. So. This is a, a bar, not really a bedroom, but uh, there is a bed in here and Farkas sleeps in it. So I believe Farkas is marriageable. I believe both of the brothers are. But that doesn't matter to me. Here's Vilkas's bedroom. Again, none of this becomes free to take, so I'll go ahead and steal all of it. Unlike the other room, a lot of this actually is useful. All those ingredients I just grabbed, the Charis eggs. Handy dandy. Gotta keep an eye on my carry weight. Starting to run up fast. There's a death bell. I think I needed ten more of those, so with that one, the number drops to nine. Excellent. There's a set of Ice Wraith teeth. And I already got all of that that I need. Lycanthropic Legends of Skyrim. That's a new book. By Lentulus Inventius, Order of the Horn. I had heard the same rumors as everyone else, that the province of Skyrim was awash in various forms of lycanthropy. I had studied werewolves for some time, and was keen to see if these rumors of were-bears were actually substantiated. I elected to pursue these studies in the warmer summer months in deference to my fragile constitution. One quickly finds that common villagers are of practically no use in this land. Whereas in Cyrodiil, even the youngest child can tell you the true fauna that inhabit its environs, here I find alleged wise men recounting tales of unicorns and flying horses directly alongside their stories of werebears, so I don't put any stock in the rumors. They certainly have their traditions for warding off werebears, certain plants and ceremonies, but nobody can attest to even having seen one firsthand, much less possess any sort of artifact. Everyone has a cousin or a friend who saw one once, but when pressed, these stories fall apart. I don't wish to completely discount these stories, but I also must conclude that they may have spun out of some wild retelling of a particularly vicious but mundane bear. Legends can take a life of their own, particularly when there are grains of truth, as here we have the very real threat of werewolves. I worry that by spreading stories of a potentially false, or at least rare, beast, people may begin to discount the threat that real beasts pose. But if Skyrim's people choose to lead a backwards life, shrieking at shadows and clouds, I will not stop them. The werewolves of this land are a curious sort, at least the legends of them. Given the Nord flair for bravado, I had expected to see werewolf pelts lining walls in the cities, werewolf heads on pikes, that sort of gaudy show. Instead, few people in civilized society ever mentioned them, and my questions were usually met with nervous stares. Thinking that perhaps the common folk were simply more cowardly than I had been led to believe by my Nordic acquaintances in Cyrodiil, I sought out those known for actual bravery. The supposedly fearless warrior band of Whiterun, the Companions, lost all color when I broached the subject and asked me to leave. I had thought better of them, and was disappointed at how quickly brave men and women can be intimidated by stories. Pressing into the wilderness, away from any sort of settlement, I would often find hunters willing to recount stories of their kills. It was finally through one of them, a certain Karsten Hammerback, that I heard my first and unfortunately only verifiable stories of werewolves in the province, accompanied by pelts and claws to prove the killing. Just as I was thrilling to finding some actual evidence of the local beasts, he got a wild, conspiratorial look in his eyes and began spinning tales of some band of werewolf hunters and their exploits in hunting down the creatures. I left him to mop his drool and continued my journeys. In the end, I regret that my trip to Skyrim did not prove more productive. If it is indeed true that their breeds of lycanthropes are distinct from and more powerful than our local ones, 
they could prove to be powerful allies in our conflict against the influx of werevultures in Valenwood. If they have known as great and ter if they have grown as great and terrible as my friend Galian asserts, they could soon threaten the interior of Tamriel. When the summer next crests, I plan to travel there for a better accounting of the winged Cretans, so that I may make more fitting report to the council. There you go. Carry weight's nearly maxed out. I'm also nearly got the room clear. 298, 299, 300. So close. The good news is, I know yes? that everything I'm carrying is either useful or stolen. So there's no need to stop off at any merchants. We can just head to Bree's home, offload it all, and then come back. That's exactly what we're going to do. Now, if you paid attention to Songs of the Return, Volume 7, you remember that your Vasker itself is one of the ships that the original companions used to cross the ocean and come to Tamriel. And they found the Skyforge and they turned it over and built the Mead Hall out of it. And if you look at it, you can easily see the shape and realize that that part of the story at least is true. I find that interesting. Well, let's just keep on going. Um, are you in trouble? Is that why you're hiding like that? Ripe fruit and fresh vegetables for sale. I've got a recipe. Brief is a big meanie. She keeps telling Lars and me what to do. I don't want to play with her anymore. Probably, if I ever have kids in real life, I probably shouldn't just blow past them like that if they're trying to talk to me. But uh, let's start with stolen stuff. That's easier. When we have an inventory of what useful stuff we found and where I need to go to offload it. So, Iron Battle Axe, Iron Dagger, Iron War Axe. Boots, boots, clothes, clothes, fine boots, fine clothes. Whole bunch of stuff. Just need to hold on to one potion of cure disease. Everything except the Haunting Brew Mead. All the books. And all this clutter. Well, I know I got the one death bell. It's Long just life to you. useful. So let's mosey over here to the cupboard. The smithing cupboard, I mean. Put away the pelt, and the gem, and the two ingots. Head over here. Put away all the ingredients I found. Lo and behold, that does it. Alright, back to work. So we've been going what? 20 minutes-ish, I think. Do you get to the Cloud District very oh, often? that's good. Oh, what am I saying? Well, let's do Still saving the bottle of mead for a night I'd like to get a little drunker. Right now I'm sipping at an Angry Orchard Hard Cider. It's delicious. If you've never had one, mm, it's good. For a night, you'd like something only very lightly alcoholic. Well, let's just head back in here. I realize I'm deviating somewhat from my usual pattern, but... I don't know. This feels right to me for this, for this place.
I should note that as much as we might want it, that's not actually an ebony sword and we can't take it. What now? Alright, we were in Vilkus's room. We left just a couple of pots, I think. Or jugs or something like it. And some boots that I almost missed. And I never actually looted the dresser either. Okay. Let's go across. <coughs> we'll head left first. This is Ayla the Huntress's room. There's some useful stuff in here for sure. 13 gold. And an expert locked display case. First I have two breakable picks. Of course I'd like to experts hard enough that I should probably actually use them. I oh, failed anyway, so there you go. Oh, it's somewhere on the left. Got it. There's an elven bow in here. We already have one of those. And a book, The Marksmanship Lesson. Archery increased to 19. So yes, let's go take this off the book list. It's our second archery skill book. And if I go to free skill boosts, down at archery, there are 11 boosts left. That's now down to 10. There are three skill books to find. The Marksmanship Lesson by Ala Lalef. Kelmeril Bryn had very definite opinions on how things should be done. Every slave he bought on the day he bought him or her was soundly whipped in the courtyard for a period of one to three hours, depending on the individual degree of independent spirit. The whip he used, or had his castellan use, was of wet, knotted cloth, which regularly drew blood, but very seldom maimed. To his great satisfaction and personal pride, few slaves ever needed to be whipped more than once. <clears throat> the memory of their first day, and the sight and sound of every subsequent slave's first day, stayed with them throughout their lives. When Bryn bought his first Bosmer slave, he ordered his castellan to whip him only for an hour. The creature, which Bryn had named Dob, seemed so much more delicate than the Argonians and Khajidian orcs who made up the bulk of his slaves. Dob was clearly ill-suited for work in the mines or in the fields, but he seemed presentable enough for domestic service. Dob did his work quietly and tolerably well. Bryn occasionally had to correct him by refusing him food, but the punishment never needed to go further. Whenever guests arrived at the plantation, the sight of the exotic and elegant addition to Bryn's household staff always impressed them. Here you, said Genetha Ilok, a minor but still noble member of the house in Doral, as Dob presented her with a glass of wine. Were you born a slave? No, said Dora, Dob answered with a bow. I used to rob nice ladies like you on the road. The company all laughed with delight, but Kelmaril Bryn checked with the slave trader from whom he had bought Dob and found that the story was true. The Bosmer had been a highwayman, though not one of any great notoriety, before he had been caught and sold into slavery as punishment. It seemed so extraordinary that a quiet fellow like Dob, who always looked respectfully downward at the sight of his superiors, could have been a criminal. Bryn made up his mind to question him about it. You must have used some sort of weapon when you were robbing all those pilgrims and merchants, Bryn grinned as he watched Dob mop. Yes, Sidura, Dob replied humbly, a bow. Of course, you Bosmeri are supposed to be very handy with those. Bryn thought a moment and then asked, A bit of a marksman, were you? Dob nodded humbly. You will tutor my son Wadilik in archery, the master said after another moment's pause. Wadilik was twelve years of age and had been rather sadly spoiled by his mother, Bryn's late wife. The boy was useless at swordplay, fearful of being cut. He embarrassed his father's pride, but the personality defect seemed ideally suited to the bow. Bryn had his castellan purchase a finely wrought bow, several quivers of arrows, and ordered targets to be set up in the wildflower field next to the plantation house. In a few days' time, the lessons began. For the first few days, 
The master watched Wadilik and Dob to be certain that the slave knew how to teach. He was pleased to see the boy learn the grips and the different stances. Business concerns, however, had to take precedence. Rin only had time to see to it that the lessons were continuing, but not how well they were progressing. It was a month's time before the issue was re-examined. Rin and his castellan were reviewing the plantation's earnings and expenses, and they had come to the area of miscellaneous household costs. You might also check to see how many targets in the field need to be repaired. I have already anticipated that, Sedura, said the castellan. They are in pristine condition. How is that possible? Bryn shook his head. I've seen targets fall apart after only a few good shots. There shouldn't be anything left after a month's worth of lessons. There are no holes of any kind in the targets, Sedura. See for yourself. As it happened at that hour, the marksmanship lesson was underway. Bryn walked across the field, watching Dob guide Wadilik's arm as the boy took aim at the sky. The arrow flew up into an arc, over the top of the target, burying itself in the ground. Bryn examined the target and found it to be, as his castellan said, in pristine condition. No arrow had touched it. Master Wadilik, you must pull your right arm down further, Dob was saying, and the follow-through is essential if you expect your arrow to gain any height. Height? Bryn snarled. What about accuracy? Unless he's been secretly racking up a high kill ratio on birds, you haven't taught my son a thing about marksmanship. Dob bowed humbly. Sedura, first Master Wadilik must become comfortable with the weapon before he need worry about accuracy. In Valenwood, we learn by watching the bolt arc at different levels in different winds before we try very hard to strike targets. Bryn's face turned purple with fury. I'm not a fool. I should have known not to trust a slave with my boy's education. The master grabbed Dob and shoved him toward the plantation house. Dob, head down, began the humble, shuffling walk he had learned in his domestic duties. Wodilik, tears streaming down his face, tried to follow. You stay in practice, ro roared his father. Try aiming at the target itself, not at the sky. You are not coming back into the house until there is one hole in that damned bullseye. The boy tearfully returned to practice, while Bryn bought, brought Dob into the courtyard and called for his whip. Dob suddenly broke away and scrambled to hide between some barrels in the center of the yard. Take your punishment, slave. I should have never shown you mercy the day I bought you, Bryn bellowed, bringing the whip down on Dob's exposed back again and again. I have to toughen you up. There will be no more soft jobs as tutor and valet in your future. Wodilik's plaintive yell drifted in from the meadow. I can't. Father, I can't hit it. Master Wodilik, Dob cried back as loud as he could, his voice shaking with pain. Keep your left arm straight and aim slightly east. The wind has changed. Stop confusing my son, Bryn screamed. You'll be in the salt rice fields if I don't beat you to death first like you deserve. Dob, the boy wailed far away. I still can't hit it. Master Wodilik, take four steps back, aim east, and don't be afraid of the height. Dob tore away from the barrels, hiding under a cart near the wall. Bryn pursued him, raining down blows. The boy's arrow sailed high over the target and kept climbing, reaching a pinnacle at the edge of the plantation house before coming down in a magnificent arc. Bryn tasted the blood before he realized he'd been hit. Gingerly, he raised his hands and felt the arrowhead protruding out of the back of his neck. He looked at Dob crouching under the wagon and thought he saw a thin smile cross the slave's lips. Just for an instant before he died, Bryn saw the face of the rogue highwayman on Dob. Bullseye, Master Wodilik, Dob crowed. There you go. See, so we got some slaughterfish eggs in that bowl. Always handy. Nothing new there. Several more ice wraith teeth. That's always nice. That's not a real goat hide, but it is a real wolf pelt. apples. There we go. Ayala's room is clear, which leaves us with skewers. Like the others, nothing in here ever becomes free to take. Oh, there's some handy stuff in here, to be sure. Silver ingots. See, I think I got... Did I get the last deer hide I needed? I think I did. Yes, I did. So that's just handy, as is the cowhide. Just 
Skewer's bookshelf. Let's see, we got some creep clusters. It's always nice. There we have some fire salt. I needed five, so with that I need four more. As we go over here, we find a nightshade. I needed 19 more, so the number is now 18. Perfect. Let's see, we've read Dunmer of Skyrim. That isn't new. Inside this cupboard, we have two copies of a new book called The Totems of Hircine. Let's read this one. The Totems of Hircine. Among those of us to whom Lord Hircine bestowed his most precious gift of lycanthropy, there are legends that he also set into the world specific artifacts of his power. <coughs> they date to a period when men could neither write, nor speak, nor barely think but the powers of blood of the beast were yet flowing strong among the selected. The first, a carved skull of the wolf itself, used by those ancient shamans in the blood ceremonies that created our lineage. It is said to grant a great presence to those who prostrate themselves before it, such that those who witness their forms cower in a terror unknown except to those who have glimpsed the face of Hircine himself. The second, a thigh bone, carved as the skull, but from some animal unknown. Used as some form of medicinal wand in the more ancient brotherhood, it was said to grant a kind of heightened awareness, both in sight and smell, such that the prey could never flee too far from our senses. The third, a simple drum, its mundane appearance meaning it is most likely lost to the mists of long ago time. As our fathers would beat time to summon their brethren from the fields, so too would our forebears in the blood call their allies to them with its pounding. Through these totems we channel and focus our energies of the beast. While, while werewolves give up the powers of magic known to men, we can tap into a more direct natural energy at times, and through these totems discover the abilities that first tamed the world before wrought civilization sullied it. Well, there you go. <coughs> Spoiler alert, the companions are werewolves, and as we advance through the quest line, we will become one ourselves. And after the quest line is finished, you can go hunt for those totems to give your werewolf form a broader range of abilities. Lock picking the 48, an expert lock on a steel dagger, that seems odd, but to each his own. And in addition, in Dawnguard, we have werewolf perks to contend with, but I'll explain that once we actually pity. become a werewolf. Lastly, we have the Harbinger's Quarters. Now, everything in there eventually becomes free to take, but not until the Companion's quest line is finished and we become the Harbinger. But if it eventually becomes free to take, all I'm getting out of there is useful stuff. So. But I still hear the call of the blood. We all do. It is our burden to bear. But we can. Let's and listen to their conversation. You have my brother and I, obviously. But I don't know if the rest will go along quite so easily. Leave that to me. There we go. Another expert locked display case. <coughs> oh, shoot, I have two lock picks. I'm just so used to rolling with only one. I gave up when it break broke, and that was, well, that was silly. There we go. Lock picking to 49. Dwarven greatsword. It's not an upgrade. I already have one, so I'll leave it. Pick this one open now. The 
Elven Warhammer. Not into Warhammers. Prefer great swords, not two handed endeavors. So we'll leave that be. And that one, we have a glass dagger. Not into daggers either. More sword man. That display case up top is empty. So let's just look for any new books in this shelf, as well as anything useful. There are no new books. There are a couple of handy ingredients. We got a giant's toe, and I think just the one single tundra cotton. Put, put the bowl back where it was, ish. Come on, get back in there. There we go. See if I can't kick the Tundra Cotton along, since it won't let me pick it up. There we can move on. There's a Daedra Heart. It's supposed to be on that table, but it tends to fall, as you saw just then. But I needed two more Daedra Hearts. With that one, I only need one more. Awesome. Let's keep looking over here. Hmm. I need those death bells. Let's look up here first. There's nothing new up there. I want the coin purse. Take it. I wonder why. There we go. I just want to pick up the death bells and take them. So, with that, I need eight more death bell. I guess it's like playing pick up sticks. I just have to go for the right one. With this, we're down to seven. There are three more. Six. Five. Now let's look at this shelf. I like you really want to take the bowl. I was more interested in the spider eggs. It's alright, I counted six spider eggs, so I'll have to get all those too, but here's a troll fat. Let's get the spider eggs that spilled onto the floor. Seven spider eggs, my mistake. Three. Four. Five. Sorry about the tedium here, these guys are just sitting in a bad spot. And that time I accidentally double tapped E, and I only meant to hit it once. Six. And seven. Let's go ahead and grab the bleeding crown out of that shelf. Also useful. And last, I do want to try and put the bowl back because respawns just happen strangely if things are too far out of position. So let's just put that right back. And let's read these two books. 
Great Harbingers. That's a new one. Great Harbingers of the Companions. This history is recorded by Swick the Longsighted of the Circle of Yorvasker in the Third Era. While I am not gifted with a sharp gift of words, I have learned the st stories of the companions bef before me and set to record them that they might not be lost when I am. Hereafter is the list of notable harbingers of the companions, those who lead us through the darkness to glories in Sovngarde. Notes on the Harbinger. The companions have never had a true leader since Ysgrimor. None have been mighty enough to corral the great hearts that beat within Yorvaskar. While others like mages and thieves need the blessings of their hierarchy to know how to dress, we companions are capable of leading our own destinies to glory. The Harbinger advises, resolves disputes, and helps to clarify when questions arise of the nature of honor. In the thousands of years the companions have held at Yorvaskar, there have been harbingers both terrible and brilliant, those known for their arm, those for their hearts, and those for their minds. Here are listed some of the most gloried harbingers who inspire song and deed. Ysgrimor, the first harbinger, the first man, the bringer of words, and the one who first bound the companions to honor in that far-off land of long ago. Better people have written of him, so I will not attempt to meet their words. Jeek of the River, captain of Yorvaskar during the return, discoverer of the Skyforge, founder of Whiterun, and keeper of the original Oath of the Companions, now lost to time. While other crews sought glory and conquest, his was the first to settle and serve as protector for the less war gifted in the land as they came behind. Mrithwil the Withdrawn. Several hundred years after the death of Ysgrimor, the companions as we now know them were soldiers for hire, little better than mercenaries. Our services could be purchased for the fighting of wars, but the commitment to individual honor meant that often shield brothers would be forced to face each other on the field of battle. The bonds of honor which bind the companions threatened to break, until Mrifwil, in his wisdom, decreed that we would no longer be party to any war or political conflict of any kind. Because of his steady hand, the companions today are known as impartial arbiters of honor, in addition to their glories on the field of battle. Sirach the Lofty, the first harbinger to not be of ancestral Atmoran blood. This was around the time that the Nords began to think of themselves as such and there were great disputes about purity and the legacy of Ysgrimor. Sirach first came to Yorvaskar as a servant, but the Red Guard quickly proved his mettle when treated disrespectfully by one of the last honor-bound warriors of the time. Granted the stature of an honorary companion after saving the life of Harbinger Tulvar the Unmentioned, he became known as the most capable of shield brothers in the hall, with speed and cunning surpassing any of the old Atmoran stock. His time as Harbinger was short-lived, but it is said that his field knowledge of blade work continues to pass to every new companion through their training. Henantir the Outsider, the first elven harbinger. Like Sirak before him, he was initially subject to ridicule when arriving at Yorvaskar, for this was the time near the closing of the first era when elves were not permitted to be full companions, and few were even allowed to see the inside of the hall. Henantir was humble in the daylight hours, performing any task asked of him, at night, he trained fiercely in the outside yard, allowing himself only minutes of sleep before resuming his servant duties the next day. So he toiled through several harbingers, never resting, never complaining, and always keeping his mind and body sharp. Given his long life, he came to be trusted by the new companions as the one who then learned the ways of honor. When one such pupil had aged into an old man and become harbinger himself, Henantir was the one at his deathbed. With all companions assembled, he named Henantir as his successor, saying even an elf can be born with the heart of a Nord sometimes. There were some number of companions who laid down their weapons that day, but those who remained knew the truth of honor, and it is their legacy we continue to bear. Mackie of the Piercing Eyes, a harbinger known for her great beauty, but any who underestimated her on account of it would never make the mistake again, was said to have once stared down half an opposing army then slaughtered the remainder single-handedly. Her disappearance in her eighth year as Harbinger has never been explained, though many slanderous lies claim to make accountings for it. Kirnil Longnose. After the dark periods in the late Second Era, 
When a string of false and dishonorable harbingers laid claim to Yorvaskar, it was Kirnil Longnose who gathered the true hearts of the companions in the wilds and stormed Yorvaskar itself, killing the usurpers and returning honor through blood in the old ways. He began the tradition of trusted advisers called the Circle, after our great Lord Isgrimor's Council of Captains, who would serve as examples to the younger, newer companions. By ensuring that the notions of honor could have an unbroken string of tradition, he steadied the course of the companions and restored our destinies to that of Isgrimor's, pressing ever onwards to Sovngarde. And another book, Song of Froromir. Two-handed increased to fifty-five. And so we take Song of Froromir off the book list. And we also have to bounce over to free skill boosts. I have six left for two-handed, so that number drops to five. Three skill books left to find. Song of Roormir. Roormir, son of Rorgar, summoned to the court of Vyndak, son of Vyndmor, king of Evensnow. Mighty caster of magic, I charge thee to go to Elfendor, for its hoary warriors do threaten my land, and bring forth their cousin demons to terrify my people. Roormir, son of Rorgar, heard the words of Vyndak Evensnow. By ice staff, surely I would help thee, but I have already a quest to drink twelve flagons of mead in one hour, and then to bed four wenches twice each, so I must with grace decline. The king he did not smile at Roormir and his jolly spirit. By thine honor must thou aidest my cause, for must thou takest up the sword of thy companion Darfang, who took the quest and failed. Roormir laughed. Now I know thou jest. My boon mate Darfang wouldst not fail, there be no finer bladesman. If thou chargest him, he wouldst not fall. I did not say he fell. He joined the dark kings of Elfendor, and by doing so dishonored himself and thee his friend. Roormir could not believe the words, <coughs> and yet he knew ever snow didst, didst not lie. So for twenty days and three rodeth he to the land of night, the kingdom of fear, where the peasants ever carried candles, knowing what evil awaiteth them should they stray beyond the glow. The sovereignty of three dark kings, Elfendor, there, torch in hand, didst Troormir pass through haunted countryside and frightened villages and through the black gates of the blacker castle of Elfendor. The three dark kings didst sneer at the sight of mighty Troormir, and summoned they their champion, Darfang the Blade. <laughs> My boon companion, Roormir called in the Hall of Night, I dare not trust my eyes, for then I wouldst believe that thou hast joined with evil, and turned thy way from honor and brotherhood. Roormir, Darfang the Blade, didst cry, if thou dost not go now, one of us must die, for I hate thee. But Roormir was battle ready, and in the echoing halls of night, the blade of Darfang and the staff of Roormir didst strike again and yet again. Mighty warriors and mages both, the boon companions now foes, shook Mundus with their war. They might have fought for a year if there were sun in Elfendor to mark time, and either Hroormir or Darfang may verily have won. But Hroormir saw through the dark the tears in the eyes of his former friend, and then he saw the shadow of Darfang were not his own, and so with ice staff he did strike not Darfang, but his shadow, which cried, Hold, mortal man! The shadow became a the hag, bent and twisted in her cloak and hood. From her faceless shadows she hissed, Mortal man called Froormir, the soul of thy boon companion is my plaything, but I will take thine in trade, for though ye both have strong arms, thou hast the more clever mind, which my sons the dark kings need for a champion of Elfendor. Froormir the brave didst not take a breath or pause before he boldly said, Shadowy hag, release Darfang, and thou mayst use me as thou will. The hag didst laugh and freed Darfang, to save thine honor, this thou hast done, but now thou must be without honor, mortal man, as the champion of the dark kings, my heirs of Grey Maybe. Thou must help them divide Elfendor, and love me, thy shadowy hag, and thy mistress well. For his loss of honor and his dear friend's sacrifice, noble Darfang prepared to take his dagger and plunge it in his good heart. But Froromir stayed his brother's hand and whispered, No, boon companion, wait for me at the village banquet hall. And then did Darfang the Blade leave the castle, while Froormir took the withered claw of the hag and pressed it to his lips. Shadowy hag, to thee I pledge, to only honor thy black words, to turn my back on truth, to aid thy dark king's ambition, to divide their inheritance fairly, to love thee, to think thee beautiful. Then to the chamber in the heart of night, Froormir and the hag did retire, kissed he there her wrinkled lips and her wrinkled sagging breasts for ten days and nights and three did Froormir and his ice staff battle thus 
Then sweet Kinnereth blew honeyed winds o'er the hills and forest glens of Elfindor, and the caress of warm-blooded Dibella coaxed the blossoms to wanton display, so that Elfindor became a garden of all the senses. The frightened servants of the dark kings woke to find there was naught to fear, and through the once dark streets of the village came the cries of celebration. In the banquet hall of the village, Cromir and his boon companion Darfang embraced and drank of rich mead. The shadowy hag, too, was smiling, sleeping still in her soft bed, until the morning sun touched her naked face, and she awoke and saw all, and knew all saw her, and she cried out, Mortal man! Night fell fast upon the land as the hag flew into the banquet hall, casting blackest darkness in her wake, but all the celebrants still could see her anger in her monstrous face, and they shook with fear. The hag had said the kingdom was to be divided among her heirs, but Elfendor had been kept whole while her children divided, drawn and quartered. Thormir was mightily amused. He swallowed his laughter in his mead, for none should laugh outright at the Daedra Lord Nocturnal. Without her grey cowl of shadowed night, her hideous face forced the moons to hide themselves. Thormir the mighty did not quail. Where'st be thine hood, shadowy hag? Mortal man has taken it from me unaware. When I awoke, my face unmasked, my kingdom cast into the light. My dark king airs in pieces cast, and here my champion smiles. Yet in truth thou kept thy promise truly, to never keep thy promise true. Thormir, son of Rorgar, bowed to the hag his queen, and evermore till thou releaseth me will I serve thee so. A clever mind in a champion is a much overvalued trait. The hag released Thormir's soul, and he released her hood. And so in the light of darkest to dark she left Elfendor evermore, and after drinking twelve flagons of mead, and bedding four wenches twice each, did Darfang return to Eversnow with Thormir, son of Thorgar. That's fun, I suppose. Let's see, up top we got a silver ingot. So let's swipe that. Kind of handy thing we want to keep our we want to take with us. Let's look at the books here on the desk. First Hold Revolt and Songs of the Return, Volume 24. That's actually a new one. The last one of the songs. Songs of the Return, Volume 24. The first tale of the Creelot Lock. When the time came for breaking of camp, not all crews took southwards across the rolling lands. Some turned with quick eyes back to their ships, for their hearts were bounded to the waves as sure as they were bounded to each other as allied companions. One such crew was that of the Creelot Lock, sinewy longfolk from the eastern edge of Alma at Mora. Their ruddy skin matched the dawn, and it was often said that Morning herself learned her glorious colors from the first faces to meet her at the break of day. The great kind lifted their souls and their winds, propelling them westwards with the new lands of Tamriel ever beckoning to the south. <coughs> In time, these perpetual wanderers came upon sights fearsome and terrible. Entire kingdoms of men beyond their recognition, skin charred like overcooked meat. Elves, even more devious than the northern betrayers, disgraced their horizons, until they learned the sheltered ways between. Great deserts, the likes of which were never known in the homeland, peopled by beasts that spoke like men with the savagery of elves. Many a notable and well-sung companion met his end at the spears of the legged snakes of the southern marsh. Among the brave crew of the Creelot Lock were of Roeth and Breath the Elder, the great shield brothers who often swapped spears, and their war wives, Britta and Graef the Fair Child, shield sisters in their own right who could bring the face of terror across the ice-chilled seas. Together these four stared into the abyss of trees that formed the foul-smelling homeland of the snake men and as they were blessed at Morans who feared no shore of Tamriel, they ventured forth to seek out their glories in the most dangerous of these new lands. Onward they flew, ravaging the swamplands, beating a trail between themselves and their ship, such that they would never lose sight of the shore. In the far-off day when at last Roeth would fall, when Britta screamed her famed war cry so that all the marshes were emptied, this trail would fill once more with the treacherous snake men. So began the burning march of these great captains of us all. There you go. Let's get this coin purse. And then we'll go check out his bedroom. And then, at that point, I think it'll have been an hour. So we'll go offload. Then we'll come back and start questing and clear out the stuff that becomes free to take. So, only useful stuff here. We got ten gold. 
salt piles. Inside the end table, one gold. Inside that end table, seven gold. Yet another coin purse. Over here, another coin purse. Inside the cupboard, we've got four gold. Inside the chest, we have nine gold. And here's the most important thing, our third unusual gem. 21 to go. So, since we've been going about an hour, let's go you off road hide, I can and call it a video. Then we'll come back, we'll do the first quest, take up arms, take all the stuff that's free to take, talk to all 12 people, pick all their pockets. Oh, I'm just a servant, dear. And then you want to talk to one of the companions, I'm sure. Then the second quest will be a radiant one, and I'm gonna be careful. You can kind of influence which quest you get by you know, talking to them more than once, or you know, reloading and trying again if you get a quest you don't like. I just want to make sure that the location for the quest, wherever it is, is something that's in my planned route prior to Dustman's Cairn. So. We'll do that. <clears throat> you may have noticed Sneak increased to 70, which is the cutoff for the last perk I eventually want to get, which is Silence. You've been a good friend to me. Go cast that your fancy so magic good. someplace else. Come to chat with an old woman. Mm -hmm. So again, I still shouldn't have anything to sell. <coughs> with my mother. Sell fruits and vegetables. What are you looking at? Into the house we go. Boys, girls, dogs, elders. Get out of my Get house, out. Brace. Anyway, let's put stolen stuff in the dresser like we usually do. So that includes those iron daggers, the steel dagger, and the second elven bow. All these clothes. Everything besides the Potion of Cure Disease. Everything besides my Haunting Brew Mead. <sighs> I bumped the mouse and the Haunting Brew Mead went in. I gotta go fetch... Fetch it back out. Just one. All these books. And all the clutter. Got a lot of stuff for my smithing cupboard. Cowhide, the deer hide, the silver ingots, and the wolf pelt. And I got a lot of ingredients, too. In fact, I just realized I have some, uh, quest stuff that I'll want to put upstairs. But everything else can go in here to start off with. And we're just about ready. Call it a video. None of this is crafting cycle stuff. It's all just quest related. Anyway, let's go back to your Vasker, back to the Harbinger's quarters. We'll end the video there so we can start the next one by performing the quest to take up arms. After that, I will loot the common areas because everything in them will become free to take. Then I will talk to all 12. From the wilds. No, the first thing I'll do after take up arms is get an acceptable radiant quest. Then I'll clear up common areas. Then I'll talk to all 12 inhabitants and pick their pockets. Then we'll be ready to leave. Actually leave the city and go back to exploring new locations. As foreign as that might seem by now. Because we've been poking around Whiterun for so long. We're that close to being done. 
And we're working on a faction right now, which is a little bit different anyway. But no question, we're now at the hour mark, so let's head on down into here. Oh, I'm just a servant, dear. You want to talk to one of the companions, I'm sure. Okay, here we are. So right here, I will save. And I will exit. And I will say, this has been Let's Play Skyrim. We've sort of familiarized ourselves with your Vasker. It's time to join the companions next time. Until then, thank you very much for watching, and I'll see you then. Bye-bye.